when we focus on the breath, we're with the body in and of itself. What does that mean, in and of itself? The rest of the formula tells us that we're ardent, alert, and mindful. We're trying to put aside any greed and distress with reference to the world. In other words, we don't look at the body in terms of how it functions in the world. We're simply looking at the body in and of itself, what it's like to have an experience of a body, both right now and over time. With the breath, we're focusing on the right now. How does the breath feel right now? Where do you feel the breath? Where does the breath flow smoothly? Where does it not flow smoothly? If it's not flowing smoothly, where are the patterns of tension in the body that get in the way? These are things you can explore right here, right now. But it's all too easy to slip away from the body in and of itself to the body in the world. In other words, what it looks like to other people, what your image of the body is that you're carrying into the world, whether it's strong enough to do the work you want. All these are issues you want to put aside right now. Whether you like the body or don't like the body, that's not an issue. The issue is just being with the body right here, right now. So we need tools to cut away these tendencies to go back to our likes and dislikes about the body, our frustration with the body, our pride around the body, whatever the issues are. That's why there are other supplementary meditation themes to go along with the breath. One is to contemplate the body in terms of its elements, to realize it's made of the same elements that everything else out there is made of. It's nothing really special better or worse than they are. We can contemplate the parts of the body. That list we had just now, starting with hair of the head, and ending with urine. That in particular is especially important meditation. The beginnings of that meditation are taught to every potential monk, every potential novice. The preceptor is supposed to teach the first five, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin. And you're taught to reflect on these back and forth. Think about each part on its own. What would it be like if it were taken out of the body and just placed on the floor on its own? And it's when it's in the body, what is it with? It's with the blood and it's with all the other things we have in the body. That when you look at somebody's body you really don't want to think about. But they're there. You have to question, well, why is it you don't want to think about it? If you have other issues with the person you're dealing with, these things seem to get in the way, particularly if you're physically attracted to the other person, or if you're physically attracted to yourself, or if you're not attracted to yourself. These things get in the way of actually seeing the body in and of itself. But it's interesting that whether you like the body or don't like the body, the, the cure is the same. Look at the body in terms of its 32 parts. You can go through the list, visualize each of the parts. Where are they right now? One common exercise is to work first with the bones. Visualize each of the bones as you can remember them, starting with the bones at the tips of your fingers and going up through the hands, the arms, the shoulders. Then starting with the tips of the toes and going up through the legs, the pelvis, all the bones in the spine, up to the neck, the skull. And you realize that what you have here is the same as what everybody else has. It's a great equalizer. And it's very liberating from the idea that my body is better than other people's bodies or worse than other people's bodies, because we all have the same parts. You can think of the bodies like a mango. There's a way they eat mangoes in the Philippines. You take a knife and you go through and you cut the flesh of the mango. First you cut the sides of the mango away from the seed, and then you've got this little boat of mango in its skin. And then you cut the skin crosswise, so it's little squares. 
and then you can turn it inside out. And imagine doing that with your body. Imagining Miss Universe or whoever doing that to her body as part of her walk down the runway. And you realize that what she has is the same what you've got. And then you look at all the cosmetic industry and you realize that everything is just to paint this up, to pretend that these things are not there in the body, or to disguise the fact that it's getting older. And if you're willing to do this practice, you find it's really liberating. You're no longer a slave to the cosmetic industry or all the other facets of the advertising industry that want to make you feel bad about your body and so that you will buy their things to make you feel better about your body. I'm always amazed at the people who don't like this contemplation, saying it's imposed on them, it's unfair, or whatever. That it's oppressive. It's actually liberating, because it equalizes. And that's where whatever negative image comes up, there's a difference between a healthy negative image and a an unhealthy negative image of your body. The unhealthy one is when you see your body as deficient in one way or another, and other people's as being beautiful. The healthy one is when you see everybody as equal and having all these parts of the body that are really not all that interesting, really not all that worth holding on to. Because it's not just lust that this is meant to overcome. This contemplation is also meant to overcome any kind of attachment to the body. Realizing that this attachment can cause all kinds of problems, all kinds of suffering. I've been reading recently about someone who's decided this is a bad kind of contemplation and decided to substitute with another one, having goodwill for your body and goodwill for any sense of shame around the body. But as she'd also noticed that the results of this contemplation were pretty fragile. Every time a new wrinkle appeared, she'd have to go through it all over again. Which if you realize there's really nothing here worth getting all excited about, the appearance of wrinkles is no big deal. Everybody has them. So learn to see this contemplation is really liberating. And John Mahabua talks about it as one of his main contemplations for gaining insight, not only into your ideas about your own body, but about everybody else's bodies. And particularly your perception of what's attractive and what's not attractive. It's the perception that you're after. Why are your perceptions so arbitrary? What's hiding behind the fact that you choose one perception over another? This is attractive, that's not attractive. Your perceptions are driven by your greed, aversion, and delusion. And if you can't see that, you'll never be free from your greed, aversion, and delusion, because they'll be parading these perceptions and fooling you all the time. So this is a contemplation that's it's not bad-mouthing the body, it's just focusing on how the mind relates to the body, and putting the mind in a position where it really can be with the body just in and of itself. So you begin to see other things in and of themselves as well, your feelings, your perceptions, thought fabrications, states of your mind, any qualities that would pull you away from staying with the body here in the present, or any qualities that would help. You want to be able to see these things clearly. And the more you're able to step back from either your pride around your body or your shame around your body, and realize that neither one is an emotion that's going to be really helpful, or an attitude that's going to be really helpful in the practice. You're that much closer to freedom. to finding a happiness that's independent from both the body and the events in your mind. It's not like we're saying the body is bad and the mind is good. There's something deeper than even your mind that we're after. As the Buddha says, it can be touched by the mind and it's touched at the body. In other words, right here in the present moment where the mind and the body meet where you have an experience of the body right now, that's where the experience of 
the deathless will come. And as long as the mind has these issues around liking or disliking the body, it's not going to be able to see that other dimension. So use this contemplation for its intended purpose. It's not to hate the body, it's to free you from the body, and free you from all the attitudes in the mind that get attached to the body and then either like it or dislike it because of the attachment. When you understand this contemplation, you find it really is very helpful. And it's one of the kindest things the Buddha left behind. <laughs>